A Netflix original film. The Wi-Fi is working. In the event of a global communications breakdown, do the following. Stay inside. What just happened here is happening everywhere. Avoid strangers. We've all been deserted. I don't trust them. And most importantly, do not panic. <laughs> Julia Roberts. What happens next? Mahershala Ali. I knew something was coming. Leave the world behind. Rated R. In select theaters now and on Netflix December 8th. Hi, and welcome to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the Supreme Court and the rule of law. And I am Dahlia Lithwick, and that's my beat at Slate. I will send to the Senate the nomination of Judge Sandra Day O'Connor of Arizona Court of Appeals for confirmation as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. I commend her to you, and I urge the Senate's swift bipartisan confirmation so that as soon as possible, she may take her seat on the court and her place in history. Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court, died Friday morning at the age of 93. Appointed to the high court in 1981 as a result of a possibly somewhat half-hearted campaign promise by then-President Ronald Reagan, O'Connor morphed from starting off as a jurist on a mid-level court in Arizona to the single most important justice on the highest court of the land. For so many American women, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a rock star and a legend, but for a whole lot of the rest of us, had there never been an O'Connor, there would not have been a Ginsburg, and there would never have been a whole lot of the rest of us. O'Connor was famously certain about all things. She was the lobber of the first question at oral argument for years. She was the definitive voice of how the law should go and what it should be. But she was never an immovable object. O'Connor's views changed and changed again over her years on the high court, often in response to shifting public views and expectations of what the law should become. Today, in celebrating her life and commemorating her death, we will talk to Rennell Anderson-Jones, who clerked for her in the 2003 term. In the second half of the show, I'm going to be joined by my much-missed jurisprudential wingman, Mark Joseph Stern, for some big announcements and to guide us through what went down in Wednesday's arguments in Jarkissi versus SEC. That's the case challenging the authority of the Securities and Exchange Commission to enforce federal law against securities fraud. Quick spoiler, turns out Wednesday was one of those fringy theory gets a whole lot of love from the conservative justices kind of days at the Supreme Court. Later still in the show, our Slate Plus members will get to hear Mark explain some alarming new voting rights fallout from non-compliant lower courts who have chosen to respond to last year's crucial Allen v. Milligan case reaffirming the Voting Rights Act by ignoring it. We're also going to kick around some thoughts on judicial ethics and the shape of the term so far and the cigar bar neckties loosened way we do in our Slate Plus bonus segments. If you are not a Slate Plus member, head over to slate.com slash amicus plus for details on how to become a member and get your mitts on lots and lots of shiny benefits. That's slate.com slash amicus plus. And to our Slate Plus subscribers, thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting the work we do here on the show and at the magazine. We literally could not do it without you. But first, to the passing of the first woman ever to be seated on the U.S. Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor. When you have to put down on paper permanently the tests that you're going to apply and see how it works, uh, that's a challenge every single time. And you really want to do it well, and you won't know till many years have gone by how well you've succeeded. You can't tell instantly. Rennell Anderson-Jones is here to talk about what it was to clerk for Justice O'Connor and what it was to sit with her legacy as Rennell was coming up as a young woman and now old 
older and very distinguished scholar, Renell Anderson Jones, a friend of the show, is a university distinguished professor and the Lee E. Teitelbaum Chair in Law at the University of Utah. She's an affiliated fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project. And for the 2023 to 24 academic year, Ronell is also a senior visiting research fellow at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. Ronell is a former newspaper reporter and editor, and she is a First Amendment scholar who researched and rights on legal issues affecting the press and the intersection between media and the courts with an emphasis on the U.S. Supreme Court. And as I said earlier, Ronell also had the honor and distinction of being a clerk for Justice O'Connor. So I want to start, Ronell, by welcoming you back to the show, but also just telling you that our hearts are with you and the other Sandra Day O'Connor, or as we affectionately call her, sock clerks who really are in grief, I think, despite the fact that Justice O'Connor is 93 and has been ailing. Um, this is the end of a really important American legend. Thank you. And yeah, it, abs- it absolutely is. Um, it, it's nice in uh, many respects to have the, the chance uh, to mark the moment. Um, so while um, we're all um, s- sorry at the news, I think Justice O'Connor herself um, had a real pattern of uh, sort of um, hitching up her big boy pants and getting on with the work uh, was, was always her motto. And so um, I think that... Um, Part of what we want to do at this moment is try to try to do the same. So, Ronell, one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you is that you clerked for Justice O'Connor in 2003 in that term, which was important in so many ways. But literally, that was just about the time that she was being feted in the press as the single most powerful person in the country. I'm thinking of Jeffrey Rosen writing in The New York Times in 2001 in a piece called A Majority of One. He wrote at the time, quote, We are all living now in Sandra Day O'Connor's America. Take almost any of the most divisive questions in American life. And Justice O'Connor either has decided it or is about to decide it on our behalf. The Supreme Court may tell us soon whether affirmative action in public universities is permissible. And if it does, O'Connor is likely to cast the deciding vote. The court is divided about school vouchers. O'Connor's views will tip the scales, end quote. I mean, you were clerking for her at a moment where literally she was the decider, the boss the determinant. And I wonder if you could just sketch out for people who are probably hearing a lot about, you know, she was an affirmative action pick in 1981, and she came from this inferior court, and nobody knew who she was, and she wasn't even very well rated. And then she becomes, in the span of two decades, the most influential person at the U.S. Supreme Court at the beginning of the new millennium. Yeah, I really do think that it's uh, a remarkable arc. And in part, I think it's uh, because of her and who she was as a person and because of the kind of thinker that she was. Uh, She was very much a pragmatist and she was very much focused on the court as an institution, its institutional reputation. And I think that drew her to try to be something of a mediator and a pragmatist in the body that she belonged to, but also it was in part because um, she sort of uh, stood still a little in her ideology, and the court itself um, shifted around her. And so I don't, I don't necessarily think that she expected to take on that role. And I know from having been in the building and in the chambers that she didn't particularly relish it. I think that. There's a, a bit of a like misperception, right? That I, I guess a lot of lawyers and judges and justices would uh, think it was fantastic to have headlines like the sort that you described, right? To be declared the most powerful person in the world and to have it be known that it was your court. She did not feel like that. Uh, I think that she wished it weren't so and wanted uh, very much for there to be consensus and for the court itself to be respected as an institution. But I think it it weighed heavily on her, particularly in those years that you're describing towards the end of her time on the court. Um, the burden of being the swing was, um, was heavy on her. 
Ronell, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the ways in which, you know, we think about O'Connor as this trailblazing feminist icon. And in a lot of ways, she was the antithesis of that. I mean, it's such an interesting, to me, juxtaposition of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was only, you know, a few years apart, but it was entirely another generation of feminists. O'Connor famously is the cowgirl. She is forever pegged as the country club Republican in the fastidious little suits. She certainly was, at least initially, very much on side with the Reagan administration's view of the world and of the law. And here's President Reagan signaling that he thinks she's just going to be fine on abortion. Right to life people may oppose her, sir, and we just wonder if... Uh, All of those questions the Attorney General is prepared to answer. So, Mr. President, you have such a firm position on that. Can you give us yes. your feelings about her position? I am completely satisfied. He wasn't ultimately going to be satisfied because in the end... Sandra Day O'Connor betrayed the conservative legal movement on abortion in Casey in 1992. She, time and time again, had special solicitude for women in discrimination cases on so many other issues, had solicitude for the little guy. And, you know, the data suggests that even though she and Ginsburg were, in some sense, diametrically opposite, right? They agree, I think, over all the years they sat together on about 50 percent of the cases, but on gender, they were aligned almost 90 percent of the time. So I wonder if you could help us parse, and maybe this is a lot to ask uh, in the hours after her death, but a theory of how for Sandra Day O'Connor, gender mattered a lot, and it mattered not at all, and how that inflected on the ways she thought about both herself and her legacy as the first woman on the court, and how she thought about cases not just involving women, but involving discrimination and what it was to be on the outside. Justice O'Connor once told me uh, that being a woman was both her most important trait as a lawyer and her least important, and that always... uh, really sat with me. Um, and she said, you know, the, the same is true of you. Um, I mean, I, I was a first grader when she joined the court, right? So I never really knew a world in which it was impossible for women to uh, achieve things or uh, to achieve the highest rank of the legal profession, at least. And sometimes when I would hear her tell sort of firsthand to audiences the kinds of experiences that she had had coming straight out of law school and being asked about her typing skills despite being at the top of the class and being offered only secretarial positions. She was a product of her time in a lot of ways. And I think that explains the overlap that you're describing between her views and Ginsburg's views on those cases. And also uh, describes a lot of her jurisprudence. I think she was very much built by the sets of characteristics that brought her there. And because she was such a pragmatist, she really thought through that lens. She thought about the law through that lens. She thought about the law by way of its impact on people on uh, in the real world. And I think she thought about her doctrinal positions uh, through that same lens. We, we see it, um, you know, the gender issue for sure shaped her jurisprudence in that space. But I think, you know, her role as a Westerner shaped her state's rights views and her role as a person who had been elected to public office shaped her view on a lot of issues that were related to elected officials. She was sort of, it was all of a piece for her. And uh, she said lots of times that she would like her tombstone to read, here lies a good judge. And she, of course, knew full well, right, that it would read, here lies the court's first female justice. Um, And I think the tension between those two is uh, really complicated. But she herself, I think, would have acknowledged that her life experiences spoke to her in really significant ways on the question of discrimination and particularly discrimination against women. We'll be right back. Breaking news can be challenging to consume nowadays, and if you're constantly doom-scrolling on social media, it can really take a toll. If this sounds like you, check out Up First on NPR. 
up first frees you from the all-day scroll obsession by telling you everything you need to know in an easy 15 minutes. No BS, just the facts. Up first is the cure you need for the news fatigue. Up first provides the top three news stories to start your day. With digestible 10 to 15 minute episodes, it is all the news you need so you can get back to your life and feel informed without also losing your mind in the process. With the elections in 2024 and an indicted former president in court, we know it's all just going to be chaos. The show provides a concise description of the top news headlines of the day, bringing listeners up to speed quickly on what is happening in the world. So stay informed every morning with Up First. Listen now to Up First from NPR, wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Planned Parenthood. We all lead different lives, which means we have different needs when it comes to health care. Today and every day, and because of supporters like you, Planned Parenthood is committed to ensuring everyone can get the care they need to thrive. The abortion bans sweeping the nation are about control, but no one, not a judge, a politician, a family member, or a complete stranger, should be able to control your decisions about your body, your life, or your future. Together, we can reclaim our rights and restore access to safe legal abortion. Visit PlannedParenthood.org future. More now with Ronell Anderson-Jones on the passing of a legal legend and a dear friend, Sandra Day O'Connor. Here's a little bit of audio of the now retired Justice O'Connor in 2012 speaking at a Supreme Court Historical Society event marking the 30th anniversary of her appointment. I wasn't sure what I ought to do because... It's all right to be the first to do something, but I didn't want to be the last woman on the Supreme Court. (laughs) Thank goodness for that. (laughs) If I took the job and did a lousy job, it would take a long time to get another one. So it made me very nervous about it. And she's sort of deprecating herself and her role, and also it feels like, I can't quite tell, Ronell, if she... I think it's exactly the thing you've just described, where she both reckons with her historic role and then undermines it. Like, did she really think she was going to be the last woman ever on the Supreme Court? She was going to screw it up for everyone who came after? Or is just this sense of historical weight, which I don't think she felt pinned under it, but I think she felt the need to perform it in some way. And I guess I find myself thinking of both her and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the first two historic women on the court who had their entire constitutional and legal legacy erased very quickly after they stepped down. I think lots of us are thinking about that at this moment. I guess to the question of whether she meant it or was being folksy or false modest, it was probably a combination of the two. She definitely many times said uh, to a lot of us privately and to uh, many groups publicly that her life changed for the better when Justice Ginsburg joined the court, that it was a meaningful uh, sort of a difference in kind and not just a difference in degree for her uh, to sit on that body and not be the only sister among the brethren. I think she didn't care for that. She didn't care for the spotlight in that way. Uh, She didn't uh, care for the way that her votes were always parsed as the woman vote. And I think she did feel the weight of the historical burden on her shoulders that she wanted to make sure that while the spotlight was shining on her, that she was doing right uh, by the country and that she was um, doing right by the women of the country. Um, But it's also the case uh, that she did have a lot of humility to the task. Those of us who clerked for her often like to talk about this phrase that she would use when um, she was making decisions, when uh, when we would be having a heated discussion about the points that were being made by competing sides in the, in the briefs. And it was a sort of, but this, but this, but this back and forth. Um, she would sometimes throw up her hands and she would say, oh, help. And uh, none of us were really 
sure who she was asking for this help, whether it was, you know, she wanted the clerks uh, to help or she wanted heaven uh, to bestow some help upon. And it was mostly just a, a sort of exasperated cry of modesty that she recognized that the task was really big. And I think that everybody who's taking seriously the job of being a justice of the United States Supreme Court uh, feels that way. But I think she particularly felt it because of this extra spotlight that was on her from the historical row. So this leads so beautifully. I, I was literally just yesterday taking a walk with my dad, who's not much younger than Justice O'Connor uh, was. And I quoted to him that line that I have heard, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, was actually on a throw pillow in her chambers, quote, maybe in error and never in doubt. Is that really a thing that she had embroidered on a cushion. That's true. It was there. And I love it because it goes to this exact question you're just surfacing, which is kind of performing certainty even in the uncertainty. And it just seems like such a hallmark of how, you know, I'm thinking of how she always asked the first question at oral argument. She was kind of very, very clear that she knew the way. And yet, as you say, she was really changing and thinking, always said that Justice Marshall informed the way she thought about the world because she was always aware of what she didn't know that he had taught her. And so I want to play you this little clip from her talking about her decision in Bush v. Gore, which I think was maybe in error and also in doubt. But but let's have a listen. Was that the right decision? I don't know. It was a hard decision to make. But I do know this. There were at least three separate recounts of the votes, the ballots in the four counties where it was challenged. In not one of the recounts would the uh, decision have changed. So I don't worry about it. So so you no regrets as far no, as that decision is concerned? it wouldn't have changed anything. So I think that one of the things that all the obituaries are saying today is like, whoop, she seated George W. Bush. Was that as close as she comes to saying I may have made an error? Uh, it, it might be. I mean, I actually uh, think that she publicly... Uh, stated at one point that there was an actual case uh, that she thought she got it wrong on and that the court got it wrong on, which was uh, uh, Minnesota versus White involving White. Yeah. Um, judges, uh, elected judges and um, restrictions on speech um, for them. And um, but that uh, that was out of character for her <laughs> uh, to do such a thing, in part um, because I think that she I mean, Justice O'Connor was uh, above all else, maybe an institutionalist. Uh, she thought a lot about the court as an institution and its role as an institution. She thought about the integrity of the court and she thought about its legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And she was deeply, deeply attuned to that in ways that fueled most of her critics and that buoyed up most of her supporters. I think it was behind a lot of the pragmatism that she showed was that she was thinking about the rule of law and the doctrinal outcome, but she was also thinking about real police officers on the street in Fourth Amendment cases and um, real speakers in First Amendment cases and real women in affirmative action cases. And those consequences for the people were also, in her mind, consequences for the court. Um, I, I think that's absolutely the explanation for what uh, we saw in Casey, uh, where she just cared enough about the court's role and the legitimacy and integrity of the court that she wanted to elevate that as a a primary ideal. And I think the finality also ties into that, that once we have decided something, we need to own that. Um, we need to, you know, <laughs> lean into the message of the, um, of the pillow and just have it be the case that maybe we were in error, but part of our obligation to the public is um, to provide some finality. So I'm, I'm going to say this and I mean it, really 
deeply. Almost every time I ever talked to Justice O'Connor and mentioned that you were a close friend, her face would light up. She was so unbelievably fond of you. I know how much she shaped the way you think about the world. And I wonder if you can tell us, you know, in, in the years since you clerked for her, I know you've been in touch with her throughout. What is the sort of enduring thing that we don't understand about Sandra Day O'Connor, the legend, the you know, the icon, the rock star that you think about, that you tell your kids about that might surprise us a little bit in just mulling over her legacy today? Wow. Um, I guess, thank you for that. Um, uh, I mean, she definitely modeled for me uh, and for all of us um, what it means to be a good lawyer, uh, but also what it means to be a good person. Um, I mean, she she believed to her core in hard work and in bridging divides and um, in the power of ordinary people to make a difference. We talked at the beginning about the headlines that were declaring her uh, as sort of the, the most powerful, most important person in the world. And she was, in a lot of ways, uh, at that very time period, suggesting to other people that they were the most important people in the world. My, um, my all-time favorite story about my uh, time with Justice O'Connor was um, in the Several years after I clerked for her, I worked at the University of Arizona, and she came to do a short course. We team taught a course about the U.S. Supreme Court there. And once she was coming uh, to visit, and uh, in the days in the leading up to it, I was taking my little boy to his soccer practice, and I just um, offhandedly said to him and to his little friend who was in the back seat, I just need you to remind the coach that we won't be at practice later this week uh, because the justice is coming into town. And the little friend who was in the back seat said to my son, what is a justice? And my son instantly said, "Um, oh, that's a sort of a fancy word for grandma. (laughs) I was, of course, mortified that I had not somehow communicated to my kid uh, what it meant to be a justice of the United States Supreme Court. But I was also just incredibly touched because it absolutely captured that sentiment, right? That's how she presented herself to my kids. Um, the you know the New York Times was calling her the most important person in the world, and she was conveying to them that they were the most important people in the world. And I think that kind of modeling, uh, that sort of shared humility in strength, I think is really remarkable. She modeled courage and competence and self-confidence, but also incredible kindness. And um, that's what I hope people can know and remember about her. Ronell Anderson Jones is University Distinguished Professor and the Lee E. Teitelbaum Chair in Law at the University of Utah. She's an affiliated fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project. She's joining us from Yale today. And for this academic year, she's also a senior visiting research fellow at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. I think that, Ronell, your clerkship for the person that was fancy word for grandma, otherwise first woman justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, is something that Justice O'Connor would po- probably be crazy super proud of because you are, as she would have very much approved of, um, Never, never in error and never in doubt. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. We are going to take a short break, but we'll be right back with Mark Joseph Stern and some big announcements in just a moment. Today is the beginning of a new year and a new decade. The nation and the world says goodbye to the 1980s and looks to the 90s. Kawabunga. I'm Josh Levine. And for the next season of Slate's podcast, One Year, we're slipping on some incredibly baggy pants and taking you back to 1990. You'll hear about the single dad who fought back against big tobacco, all while hiding behind a secret identity. I'm looking around like people were at the bus stop looking at us, and I was like, oh my God. And here comes a police car. In Cincinnati, an art exhibit became a battleground over the First Amendment. 
I remember one of my board members said, so what's this? And I said, well, it's called fisting. And, and she said, oh, fisting, How, what's that all about? One Year, 1990. Available now, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi, Dahlia. Oh, my God, Mark. Mark, you're back. We've missed you very much. I am back. Did I miss anything while I was gone? You did miss a little bit of stuff. And you came back. And then we got plunged immediately into breaking news and the passing of Sandra Day O'Connor and a case that's another chance for this court to just end the administrative state. All all that's happening. We're going to talk about it in a minute. But in a big change of tone and pace, I wanted to, first of all, welcome you back and have you help me reveal three, not one, but three pieces of good news on this show. I know. Good news is very off-brand for Amicus. Three? Three pieces of good news in one episode of Amicus? It's ridiculous, right? And we already spoiled the good news number one chunk, which is Mark, you, my legal co-pilot, my jurisprudential wingman, the wind above my wings. You are back (laughs) in the jurisprudence cockpit. Uh, I don't know if that's how wings work, but I really, I really appreciate it. And I'm just so happy to be back. But what is good news number two? Good news number two is your mini-me. Uh, it's a mini-Mark, if you will. Uh, Mark, your family has, you didn't just fall off the planet. Uh, you were on paternity leave. Your family has grown. And it has grown beyond the birds and the dog. And it now includes a tiny little human being, a little baby. And you are back from doing your little part to launch a new generation of future Supreme Court commentators. Welcome back and welcome to your mini-me who will be covering the Supreme Court of 2057. Uh, What an absolutely harrowing thought. I rejected outright and have already started teaching my son about how he's not allowed to go anywhere near the Supreme Court because it is stranger danger and a bad, bad place. But, you know, I appreciate the sentiment. Um, I, I guess that that takes us to the third good news announcement. And I, I think I, I do know what this one is, but maybe you want to cut the ribbon? It, it, it involves a little bit of math. And this is not a math show, but that math is 100% more... 100% more, 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 more amicus. And so if I understand that right, it means double the Dahlia? Uh, yes, double the Dahlia. Uh, yes! Sharp, sharp-eared and sharp-eyed amicus listeners may have already cottoned on to the fact that there has been a soft launch of amicus as a weekly as opposed to bi-weekly podcast. But okay, here today we are making it official. There is just too much darn news to mash into a show that broadcasts every other week. And so this week is kind of a case in point. We're going to bring you a fresh episode of Amicus every single Saturday from here on in. And it's a question of not just trying to get our heads around the sheer volume of legal news that is flying at us, but because we at Slate are so committed to doing this thing that we pledged to do last spring, which is we're going to cover the court in ways that scoop up absolutely everything that has been sometimes left along the Supreme Court news gathering trail, the judicial conduct, the cases the court does not take, the fallout from cases that made headlines one time in June and then fell off the radar. 
we are going to cover cases in a way that really highlights the fact that millions of people have their lives forever altered by (laughs) words that are written in an opinion, penned in a marble temple on a hill. So to do justice to all of that, this very broad definition of doing justice, Mark, we're a weekly show. What do you think? As long as you can promise that there won't be any more math involved from here to eternity, then (laughs) I'm totally down. Let's do it. And so with that, let's turn to the Supreme Court and its doings. And this week, we are looking at the latest case that hopes to dismantle a key mechanism of the administrative state or what we think of as how government gets done. So, Mark, in your post-paternity leave print debut, you described the lengthy two-and-a-half-hour oral arguments on Wednesday morning in Jarkasi versus SEC as, quote, a catastrophe so suffused with infuriating bad faith that even Justice Elena Kagan, the model of a disciplined jurist, could not stand it, end quote. Mark, you require no introduction, but you do cover the courts and the law here in Slate. It is so good to have you and your inimitable words back. Thank you. So happy to be here. Hey, two essential uh, opening questions. Uh, How much sleep per night on average? Um, You want our sleep schedule because we have it like down to the minute. Uh, I would say that uh, over a course of 24 hours, I'm getting at least seven of sleep. And that is a huge win for me. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. That's like that was the kind of sleep we were getting at the end of last term. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, it's partly because the, the baby is um, very fickle. Some nights he's great. Some nights not so great. Uh, it's partly because I'd like to think I, I have a egalitarian relationship and, and that my husband and I are, are trading off uh, sleep duties fairly evenly. Um, but also, you know, as I've approached uh, returning to work, I, I've had an increasingly dire series of nightmares about the Supreme Court that keep me up. And so the whole thing is very erratic and unpredictable. And if I fall asleep in the middle of this recording session, listeners are just going to have to forgive me because I will not wake up. So that, that, that brings me to my second essential table setting question, which is I have heard this case variously pronounced Jarksy, Jarkazy, Jarkuzy, and I don't know. Mark, how are we pronouncing it? <sighs> <laughs> okay, the chief justice said jacuzzi, which does sound like a Jar Jar Binks jacuzzi that I would not buy. Um, up until this point, I think the conventional wisdom in the press was that it was Jarkazy. But uh, this guy's lawyer actually helpfully told the justices that it is pronounced Jarkasi. So I think we should go with what the lawyer guy says. I mean, he didn't do a very good job, but we should assume that he at least got the pronunciation of his client's name right. And will you tell us before we get into the legal thorns a little bit about Mr. Jarkasi and the conduct that brought him to the attention of the SEC? Because it's not like super awesome conduct. And it reminds me a little bit, we interviewed Senator Elizabeth Warren in October when the CFPB case uh, was heard. And it does sort of surface this larger issue. uh, And you make this point in your piece, too, which is one slightly likes to have a government that uh, does things about people like what Mr. Jarkasi allegedly did. It would be nice. So Mr. Jarkasi is a, a conservative talk radio host, and he created two hedge funds that managed about $24 million in assets, managed them poorly. He and his firm lied to their investors about where their money was actually going, which is illegal, and dramatically overvalued the holdings to jack up the management fees to extortionist prices. He said the value was just way more than it was. And so the SEC did what the SEC is supposed to do and what Congress told it to do, which is to launch an administrative proceeding um, before an administrative law judge at the agency. And the SEC prevailed in this adjudication. Uh, The agency fined Jarkasi $300,000, told him you're not allowed to participate in, in the securities industry anymore, and ordered him to disgorge or give up about $685,000 in unlawful gains. Um, All in all, you know, really not the worst 
penalty you can imagine for someone who committed this scale of financial crimes, uh, more than a slap on the wrist, but doesn't seem to me to be like the epitome of the administrative state run amok. Uh, it, it does seem like the punishment fits the crime, if, if, if not a little bit less severe than it should have been. So, Mark, this case is another one of those cases, uh, I put it in the column from last term uh, with Moore versus Harper, some of the really wackadoo original claims in Allen versus Milligan. This case could have been just a, a full on disaster. And that is in no small part because in the court below, we had in the Fifth Circuit this divided three judge panel that ruled against the SEC on everything on, on such capacious grounds that it was one of those, oh, let's just eat everything on the constitutional buffet table. We're taking the shrimp. We're taking the breadsticks. We're eating the croissants. And so uh, they did so much with so little, and they pulled in three different grounds on which to rule for jarcusy, including the, quote, non-delegation doctrine. So this case would have theoretically not just been the death knell for securities law, but also huge parts of government for the administrative state in general. I I think Ian Milheiser noted in his piece this week that some parts of what the Fifth Circuit decided the case on might have bolstered former President Donald Trump's plan to replace much of the federal civil service with his own loyalist if he gets reelected in 2024. So the court did not, at least based on oral argument, go with the full-on stuff-your-face-at-the-buffet-table view of this case. They focused kind of narrowly on this jury question. Uh, But it could have been much worse is not necessarily a good day for oral arguments, yeah? Well, I I think it's too soon to tell. I I think it's very, very likely that the court will embrace one of the three arguments um, that the Fifth Circuit affirmed, and quite possibly it'll embrace another. And and the one that I think is is pretty obviously off the table is this non-delegation claim. And that uh, revolved around the SEC's discretion to bring these kind of enforcement actions either before an administrative law judge in-house or in a federal court. And, you know, if if the Supreme Court entertained that theory, it really would just blow up the entire SEC and, and many other agencies, because this is the kind of discretion that agencies exercise every day. Um, and if the SEC was no longer allowed to do it, it might no longer be allowed to do anything because it couldn't bring any enforcement action at all. Um, and, and the justices across the spectrum clearly weren't interested in that cockamamie theory, but but they were very keen on on this uh, jury trial argument, which kind of sounds good on the surface, but when you dig in, falls apart, and we'll talk about it soon. And a few of them, especially Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who is like Mr. Executive Power uh, when there's a Republican in the White House, he was really laser focused on this other argument, which is that the administrative law judges should be uh, stripped of their independence and their protection against removal. And, And that's what Ian was talking about when he said, you know, it would empower Trump to replace the civil service with MAGA loyalists. And I do think that's still on the table. I I think there's a chance the court doesn't answer that question. But, you know, if the court does strip these judges of their independence from political interference, then there's really no reason why the next authoritarian leaning president can't start meddling in these agencies and really dictating the outcomes in order to punish his his enemies and reward his friends. So not a good day for the administrative state, not as bad as it could have been. But as you and I have said many, many times on this show, we really shouldn't let the Fifth Circuit set like the terms of the debate or or the Overton window. And so the fact that one of those theories doesn't have any purchase at the court doesn't mean that this is a moderate court or that the other two aren't still very destructive. So you just said this, but let's spin it out. It looked like the court was mostly focused on Wednesday on this narrow issue of juries and the right to jury trials and the fact that its enforcement actions are brought 
in front of these internal tribunals or administrative law judges rather than a formal, what we call an Article Three judge. And I wonder if before we get to the sort of legal distinction, you could just walk us through the formal difference between an administrative law judge on the one hand, which is, as you said, <laughs> the, the machinery for deciding so many of these agency cases, and an Article Three judge. And then we can kind of get to the broader question of how that applies to the facts of this case. Yeah. So um, the administrative law judges are these in-house judges at the SEC. And they're also at a bunch of other federal agencies. If you ever have to, say, adjudicate a, a social security claim, you'll, you'll be dealing with an ALJ, as they're called. And they are uh, independent in the sense that they act like regular old judges, um, not really influenced by partisan wins, certainly not biased against one party or the other, at least in theory. You know, they they are obligated to follow due process. They have a really strong expertise on the subject matter at hand. And I think that's important to dwell on for a minute because the cases that come before the SEC can be just mind-bogglingly complex, right? And this one is fairly straightforward, but a lot of them, you kind of need to take like a year-long course in securities law just to understand the basic basics of what's happening. And the administrative law judges, they come to the proceeding with all that background knowledge, and they can render decisions that are not only sort of logical and coherent, but consistent. And they play an important role in policymaking within an agency, because the commission, along with the administrative law judges, they can set policy based on the decisions coming out of these hearings. And the alternative to that is a jury trial in a federal court before a federal judge who is ostensibly also independent. You know, we all know that that independence waxes and wanes, uh, depending on the person in the robes. Um, But there, first of all, the proceeding tends to be way more drawn out and complicated. You know, it involves a jury, so it involves Wadir, and involves a jury of lay people. And look, you know, we, we in this country believe very strongly in the jury trial rights when it comes to criminal cases, of course, when it comes to the kind of civil disputes that were traditionally resolved by juries, one private party suing another, uh, cases involving private rights. Um, But when it comes to the U.S. government trying to enforce a really complicated law like securities law, against uh, a a private party, frankly, I I think it's just very clear that juries struggle to wrap their heads around it. And juries do not provide consistent decisions here. It's kind of chaotic. It doesn't seem like juries always grasp the basic facts of the case. When a, a case goes to a jury trial, you know, it really prevents the commission and the administrative law judges from using it to make policy. It's a mess. And more than that, it's an expensive time consuming mess that really cannot substitute for ALJ adjudication. If every single case that currently goes before administrative law judges suddenly went to a full-on jury trial in federal court, a lot of the SEC's enforcement would just stop. It would it would come to a halt because they do not have anywhere close to the resources necessary to handle that. And the federal judiciary doesn't have the resources to handle that. The docket would expand pretty radically. And some of these cases would end up waiting years even just to go to trial. And I think that the parties would frequently just give up. Specifically, the SEC would frequently just give up. So, you know, on the one hand, you have a sort of efficient, technocratic adjudication by an expert. Uh, And on the other hand, you have a more drawn out, complicated adjudication before a jury of lay people. And I think you could argue that both of them have their strengths. But the reality is that for years, the SEC has functioned by bringing most of these cases before ALJs. And that has served this country very well by enforcing securities fraud, not perfectly, but better than it would if ALJs were wiped off the map and all of these cases had to go into the federal judiciary. So I think you've just touched on the nut of the thing, which is the claim here is that the Seventh Amendment, which provides that, quote, in suits at common law, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. In Jarkissi's reading of it, that prohibits the SEC from ever bringing an enforcement action before an administrative law judge because it doesn't use a jury. And this brings us to this question of whether the Seventh Amendment precludes having administrative judges. Uh, And it 
takes us to Atlas Roofing, a case from 1977, which kind of seems to conclusively resolve it. Here is uh, a little bit of oral argument, both Katanji Brown-Jackson. Atlas Roofing uh, resolves this case. And Elena Kagan. If you look at the question presented and then you read Atlas Roofing, you wonder why this case is here. In other words, that Atlas Roofing simply resolves the issue. So, Mark, I wonder if you could just tell us what Atlas Roofing does to make this seem like a slam dunk. Yeah, so Atlas Roofing clarifies the language of the Seventh Amendment, which is important to parse here, um, because the Seventh Amendment, as you noted, says that suits at common law trigger a right to a civil jury trial. And so there are two phrases there. First is suits. The second is common law. An enforcement action brought by a federal agency is not a suit. It is not a lawsuit. It has traditionally not been considered a lawsuit. And this is something that Justice Kagan pointed out. You know, if the SEC brings this as a lawsuit in federal court, then of course the jury trial attaches. But if it doesn't, then it's traditionally been seen as not a suit and so not part of the Seventh Amendment scope. Second, the the Seventh Amendment limits this right to these claims that would arise at common law. And we could talk for hours about what that means. The Supreme Court doesn't seem to be so sure. But in Atlas Roofing, the court said those are typically claims involving private rights between private parties, as opposed to what were called equity suits, which are, sorry for the jargon, but those are usually suits brought by a sovereign, here the United States government, to enforce public rights. And so, In Atlas Roofing, the court said public rights are created by Congress to protect, you guessed it, the public. And when the United States government, through an agency, wants to enforce those rights, it is not bringing a suit at common law. And so it is well within its power to say we're going to enforce these public rights in a federal agency through adjudication, and we are going to exercise this power without the oversight of a jury because that's just not the kind of thing that the Seventh Amendment requires. If I sued you over something, anything, you know, pick it, then we would be uh, well within our rights to each demand a jury trial. But when the United States government files a claim against somebody else for running afoul of, of say, securities law or some other uh, rule set by Congress, that right doesn't attach. And and the key phrase in Atlas Roofing that Justice Kagan just, just noted again and again is that the court said the Seventh Amendment is no bar to the creation of new rights or to their enforcement outside the regular courts of law. That should be the end of this case. And and that is why Justice Kagan said, you know, it takes a lot of chutzpah for the securities fraudster here to come in and challenge Atlas Roofing, because what he's doing is saying, hey, this 50-year-old precedent that has laid the groundwork for the functioning of the administrative state, we think it's garbage, we think it's wrong, and you should just carve out a giant hole that lets us work around it every time. Let's just listen to Justice Kagan making her chutzpah argument, largely because it's very Kagan-ish. Nobody has had the, you know, chutzpah, (laughs) to quote my people, to bring it up since Atlas Roofing. So, so Mark, I think the follow-on is everything you have just set out lays bare uh, the the decades-long plan, which is the argument that the federal government and federal agencies are just way too powerful and they get up all in your face and they're kind of sinister. You and I have had this conversation multiple times, uh, the idea that all this power of federal agencies should just be handed to the next president, him and his incredibly honest and apolitical (laughs) Article Three judges. Okay, bracket that. The weirdest part of this particular oral argument for me, honestly, is Chief Justice John Roberts saying that that Atlas Roofing case at age like 50, not even, it's too old. It's really old. So let's listen to him for one second talk about, I guess, 50 is the new, I don't know, 150. It's too young for originalism. It's too old for originalism. Here is his claim, I guess, that he sniffed the Atlas Roofing case and it had gone a little. (laughs) Atlas Roofing is 50 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And the extent of uh, impact of government agencies on uh, daily life today 
is enormously more significant than it was 50 years ago. Uh, I mean, does that have any — should that be a concern for us or a consideration when we're trying to consider what power the government has to take away uh, the jury trial right or, in, as an antecedent to that, to take away the right uh, to go into court? So, Mark, I guess that's my really big takeaway. <laughs> is how can the people tasked with saying that old stuff is better than make the claim that some old stuff is too old to be of use? Uh, well, it's a great question, Dahlia, because as you know, I think you're hinting at, it really inverts the usual formula of stare decisis, of respect for precedent, right? Typically, and John Roberts has said this many times, if a case is old, the older a case is, the more entrenched it is in case law, the more respect that it deserves, the more cautious this court should be about trimming it or overturning it because it has generated a lot of reliance interest, because it has stood the test of time, because many courts have affirmed it and abided by it. But here, Roberts totally flips that on his head and said, well, if this case is old, we should have less respect for it. We should be more inclined to overturn it. It because I'm upset with how much the administrative state has grown in the intervening decades. Now, I think we should actually sort of contest the premise of this claim, not just about stare decisis, but about this idea that the administrative state has grown into some kind of monstrous enemy of, of liberty in, over the last 50 years. I mean, when the court confronted this question in the 70s, the administrative state was extremely powerful. Uh, this was very much post-New Deal uh, administrative lawmaking. This was a bunch of federal agents agencies with extraordinary power to set policy and to enforce law against private parties. This idea that everything has fundamentally changed since then, I, I just don't think it withstands any scrutiny. So what we're really hearing is, is Robert's hostility toward the very premise that these federal agencies should have this power to enforce these laws and, by extension, prevent federal judges, who I guess are sort of like the pinnacle of, of independence and expertise to John Roberts, uh, to prevent them from hearing these cases before a jury. And I think Roberts really gives the game away when he talks about administrative law judges as though they're just beady-eyed bureaucrats in the bowels of the federal government, basically part of the deep state working against individual liberties. You know, he, he calls them government employees, which I think is quite offensive and almost slanderous to administrative law judges who really do try very hard to maintain their independence across different leadership, across different presidential administrations, who have very difficult jobs, who have to make sure that they do comport with all of the requirements of due process, and who, in in my view, generally are pretty good at it. You know, there are some who are better than others, but Roberts is sort of, is sort of just slandering all of them as unworthy of this task of adjudicating these kind of claims. And in the process, I think he is hinting that the court's going to go not just for this jury trial argument, but also for this idea that either the SEC commissioners or perhaps even the president himself should have power to interfere with their work, to fire them, to replace them with cronies, to basically scramble the independence that does currently exist and refashion these administrative law hearings as a kind of weapon against their enemies, which is certainly a nightmare and would mean that the administrative state is out of of control. But it's a bit ironic that, you know, if the administrative state does take this dark turn, it'll be because of the conservative Supreme Court claiming that its interference was necessary to protect us from that state. It just it really doesn't square. The federal government employs almost 2000 administrative law judges. Uh, there's about 650 non-Article Three judges who hear immigration cases, there are fewer than 900 Article Three judges. It's a small bench. So if, let's say, the challengers here fish their wish and the United States cannot bring any cases in administrative forums, 
how are cases meant to be adjudicated? And it's particularly weird, not just in terms of the number of judges, as you said, and the, the unbelievable weights, as you said, but it didn't seem as though uh, the lawyers for Jarkissi were able to even explain what relief they saw. No, I, and that's a big problem with this case and always a red flag that they have all these grand theories, but they're they're rather unclear on exactly how the theory should be put into practice by the court. I, and we've seen this problem problem in so many previous cases where the court will take this dagger to the administrative state and then to try to maybe limit the damage, it'll just sort of rewrite the law and give, I don't know, give these appointees this new power to do X or Y or take this power away or give the president new leeway to do whatever and really scramble Congress's design. And so I frankly don't think anyone knows what it would look like if the court embraced this jury trial argument or this anti-independence argument for administrative law judges, uh, except that it would be bad. But, you know, I think that one through line here, is, as we've been noting, is this, this intent to sort of paralyze enforcement of federal statutes. And, and we're not just talking about the SEC here, right? So many agencies do this kind of adjudication. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the EPA, the Department of Labor, all of these agencies that enforce public rights against lawbreakers, often in the type of cases that just can't be heard in federal court because, uh, say, the plaintiff wouldn't have standing or there isn't a concrete harm in, in Article 3 terms. And, and so what I think the goal here is to paralyze the entire system. And that would force both the SEC and every other agency that does these adjudications to stop or dramatically roll back enforcement against a whole lot of lawbreakers because they just wouldn't have, again, the time or resources to do it. They'd have to go to jury trials every single time in a federal court, which they don't have the capacity to do and the courts don't have the capacity to do. And the courts are already really overwhelmed. Their dockets are full. We actually need new judgeships, but Congress won't create any because it's become partisan football. So yeah, it's, you know, it's depressing. And it, it's especially depressing because all of these arguments are, are just built on bunk originalism. And, you know, this is no surprise to listeners or anyone who follows this court, but it's so obvious here. I mean, one of the Fifth Circuit's key quotes in its decision was from William Blackstone, who was a, a key inspiration for, for American constitutional law. And they made it up. Like, it's not a real quote. Like, they just totally butchered this Black Stone quote to support them, and it does not support them at all. I mean, several of Kavanaugh's arguments rest on these embarrassing mistakes that misunderstand the historical record, that misunderstand what the framers actually said, or just misattribute quotes to the wrong people. There's all of this practice that goes back to the founding that shows that these adjudications were considered totally kosher, and, and the court's just ignoring it. I mean, real historians have sunk their claws into this stuff and figured out that, you know, whatever you think about jury trials, if you think every single dispute should go before a jury of your peers, whatever, that's your right to think. But that's not what the Seventh Amendment guarantees. It just isn't. It wasn't how it was understood. But this ostensibly originalist court is going to say that it was anyway. The real historians, as usual, are being totally sidelined. And the kind of pseudo historians, the activists, the, the law professors who are, who are devoted to this partisan project, they're the ones whose bogus history gets elevated by this majority. Mark, you have been so deeply, deeply missed on this show, like so much so that I get grumpy reader mail. So thank you for coming back. Uh, thank you for coming back with a mini me in tow. It is always a treat to talk to you. And I look forward, as we said up top, to getting to talk to you every week uh, or almost every week in the near future because uh, – I, I don't even I, because why because you're Mark. Because you're Mark. <laughs> Thank you for being Mark. Thank you, Dahlia. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in. And thank you so much for your letters and your questions and your comments. You can keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. You can always find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Burningham and Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus next week. Until then, hang on in there.